The challenge was so simple, it was beautiful. It was to have breakfast in New York City and dinner in Miami, all in the same day, and by boat. And it was a world record attempt, but for us it was more about the simplicity of the challenge. Could a husband and wife team travel the entire East Coast by boat in a day? And could we do it having fun? It's not going to be fun. This is going to be... This is going to be... I'm stressed too, honey. I'm with you. You know, Uncle Jeff said to me today, or Jeff said, he's like, make sure you take care of your wife. She's a trooper on this. Yeah. <sighs> Leaving at 3 in the morning is making me nervous. That's an hour and a half in the dark in uncharted territory for us and you saw some of the debris that we almost hit yesterday and we could see for those that are new to the channel or this series keep in mind that this is episode three of this epic adventure so you may want to go back to episode one to see how we prepared for this crazy challenge and how we got from portland maine to new york city in world record time. We used up these in our auxiliaries. Five hours and 35 minutes from Portland, Maine. There's a restricted buoy right there. Yeah, I know, and you keep floating into it. Well, there it is, honey. This is New York City. You guys have been fully read in. It's time to start the season finale. And as you know, I start every episode telling a story. And this story starts the morning of the day after we got there at a small cafe in New York City. I'm gonna put this right here. Let's review. We leave at 3 a.m., 17 hours from now. What do we have to do until then? Uh, check all the props, tighten all the prop nuts. We need to check all the sponsons, the exterior, hull integrity. My back is sore, my traps are sore, my arms are sore. Doing this for six hours. I'm really surprised at how bad it was yesterday yeah. and what the weather app said, what Wendy said, and what the waves said. And what we found out later to be our last meal in about 36 hours was well needed because the first thing we had to do on this checklist was go back to Liberty Landing and check out the boat from the run the day before, which was from Maine to New York City, about five and a half hours and over 300 miles of pretty rough water. To be honest with you guys, Sarah and I were pretty nervous at this time. And having a little bit of work to do on the boat was actually pretty good. It kept our minds from wandering down, well, pathways that were pretty negative and what could happen out there. After all, we still needed to sleep that night. Neither one of us knew if that was possible. I'm looking for nuts, loose bolts, broken bolts. I'm looking for splits in the paint and it all looks good. We saw some really steep four or five footers at speed and we heard some noises that i don't typically like to hear so we're gonna go in here and make sure everything's all good they're built like battleships but hearing some really hard hits it's good just to get in here look around isn't that a blues traveler song just look around Well, that's encouraging. I, I see no damage. I see no cracks. Everything looks tight. Everything sounds tight. That's why I'm hitting the hull. You hear what it sounds like? It should be a real dead sound. And uh, as you guys hopefully could tell on camera, it was. So the front looks great. Now it's time for the back. And after a complete detailed once over of the boat, it was time to review operational logistics with our ground team and make sure everybody was on the same page. There was just four of us on this team and everybody had to do their job. Tim Linden, who's our support truck driver on shore, but also a very experienced licensed captain, was in charge of navigation, fuel economy prediction, and weather forecasting. Nicole Loomis was in the support truck with Timmy, and she was in charge of all multimedia and keeping you guys up to date with our progress. And Sarah, my wife, she was on board with me as my co-captain. 
in charge of all navigation, real-time assessment of the boat's instrumentation and its overall health, and turning the auxiliary fuel valves when needed. I'm going to flip back between yeah, the two. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to put temp and pressure on there because I can see that on the regular. I'll have that on the regular screen. This is the information that you're going to feed Nicole and I. Sure. So we can see where you are. 100%. What your progress is and then be reporting the progress okay. as we're driving. We did bring a body pillow just in case he could lay down if he hurt his back. We tested it out. He can just fit. And what I'm about to show you is why it's so important to have experts on your team when navigating the East Coast, at, well, sometimes over 100 miles an hour. We're here reviewing basically the last minute GPS layout and he gave me a current GPS track from the Corps of Engineers. I'll show you guys. This is the new one that the, from the Corps of Engineers. This, the one that had coming through, totally different. Totally different from just um, a map that's you know, updated less than a couple months ago. That's how fast those channels move through the Oregon Inlet as the, as the, the tides and the currents push the, the shifting sands, like sands through the hourglass to me. And before we knew it, we were done with the to-do list. Our good friends Mike and Kelsey were headed home and it was time for us to get some sleep. But unfortunately, due to our super early departure, we had to sleep in the daytime. In New York City, yeah, that's easier said than done. And you wonder why we can't sleep. We're trying to get some sleep before this midnight run, and there's the train, there's the train station. Oh. And as everybody knows who's ever set an alarm, we finally got to sleep just about an hour before the alarm went off at 1.30 a.m. Both a little bit nervous on this one. Relax. It's going to be a day of learning how to relax. The next 24 hours, honey, are going to be a challenge. For us to have breakfast in New York City and dinner in Miami all on the same day and by boat, it was essential for us to leave super early in the morning. We just didn't have enough daylight hours. And that meant we were going to be alone in the complete darkness, traveling at 80 miles an hour far offshore for over two hours. We were really rolling the dice on this one. And it was the most nerve wracking part of the whole trip. Sitting a little low in the water. Sitting really low in the water. She's definitely fueled up and heavy we do not like florida I want you to grab the EPER. miles. Grab your EPER. Mine was already in. Okay. You have yours on? Mine is in my zipper pocket, the other side right there. Check. Okay. EPERB's in. We have a big oil tank in front of us. Black Oak is kicking some serious butt right now. It was almost like a wave of momentum. Before we knew it, it was time for our breakfast coffee, and there was no turning back. You ready, hun? Breakfast in New York City? Dinner in Miami. Cheers. Mm. My breakfast is a coffee. Cheers, we honey. And start. There's a long way to go. We're awful heavy. Just ease the throttles forward. Just like that, we were all alone, just me and my wife, driving peacefully, almost effortlessly, into the complete darkness and unknown. This bridge was so beautiful, it wasn't until we got by it did we realize just how alone we actually were and how dark things were actually gonna get. But for that one moment, we didn't care.
As we traveled into this wall of darkness at over 80 miles an hour, I couldn't help but think of how much we actually had in front of us. I mean, it was the entire east coast of the United States somewhere out in front of us. But we found the best way to handle it, mentally and emotionally, and not make it too daunting, was just to break it down into three separate missions. And the first mission seemed pretty simple. Get down the east coast 413 miles to Cape Hatteras, try to break a world record, do it all before 9 a.m., and try not to hit anything in the water in the dark going 80 miles an hour, eject yourself and your wife from the boat, and die in the meantime. All seemed pretty straightforward. Every minute felt like an eternity as I kept looking over my shoulder for that first glimpse of light. It took forever. I swear that sky looks a little brighter than it did five minutes ago. Come on. Come up, son. We're rolling the dice here. finally see in front of the boat and the seas are fair for as far as I can see we're gonna up speed here 100 miles an hour all the way to Hatteras when the Sun finally did come up we we're about halfway down the first leg right by Ocean City and it didn't take long before a situation arose we're having a little bit of light and probably saved our ass when the seas are this flat, slow rolling waves from big tankers like this can be very deceiving. They're displacing a lot of water, but not necessarily moving fast. So the waves tend to be well, fairly large and separated and hard to see until it's too late if you're traveling fast. Certainly wasn't the first tanker I passed in boats like this. So I slowed down from 100 miles an hour to about 40. And you can still hear how hard the hull hits. And we even got some air. Imagine if we had done that at 100. In a rogue wave like this from some far off tanker, it's certainly something you don't want to see at night. Unless you see the boat, you just won't see it coming. And it wasn't long after that, right around Norfolk, Virginia, that we saw one of the most dangerous things you can come across offshore if you don't know what it is. And that's a tugboat towing a barge. Now this at first sounds pretty benign, but it's not. If you drive in between these boats, which is actually pretty easy because sometimes they're separated by almost a mile, the tow cable that connects the two vessels that's just under the water can capsize your boat. And this happens unfortunately all the time. And it actually happened when I was a commercial fisherman to a sister vessel called the Heatherlin 2. In the middle of the night, she drove in between a barge and a tugboat and capsized on the cable. And unfortunately, all three fishermen ended up dying but not before trying to survive on this one pocket of air in this overturned vessel. But they were trapped. And when the tugboat captain heard them crying for help pounding on the hull, he realized there was nothing he could do. The sound soon became fainter and fainter, until nothing. And by the time Coast Guard showed up, their fate had been sealed. And sadly enough, later forensics showed that parts of their fingernails and finger skin were embedded into the fiberglass on the inside of the boat and truly a frightening illustration of how panicked they must have been. From then on as a young fisherman and went at the helm at night, I would always look for those two dots on the radar screen that were separated by a little bit of a distance, moving together and moving slowly. They were most likely a tugboat and a barge, and it was best to steer clear, literally. And for those of you that might wonder where your mind goes while well, you're at sea in the dark for hours on end, well, there you have it. Well, that was kind of downer, but on this channel, we keep it real. And about an hour later, we were rolling into Oregon Inlet. Remember, this was the place we were going to run aground if we followed the current GPS map. Did they move the buoys every month? You'll notice that I'm going on the wrong side of this marker, but I'm following the Corps of Engineers' current pathway in. You never do this unless you're positive your marker, well, is off the mark. Yep, pun intended. Sweet, some locals. We'll just follow their track in. And there's a dredger trying to correct some of these pathways. There's land just barely under the water all around us. 
After five hours, we were only about 50 miles away. We were low on gas, but I was not gonna run out here. Let's get some in the reserve tanks just to be safe so we can break this record from New York City to Hatteras, previously held by Fountain. Everywhere I go, I feel so alive. Will husband and wife adventure team breaks major boating manufacturer's world record? I'll take it. And mission complete as the boat throttles down in front of Lady Liberty. The Baby, team celebrates a new Hatteras world record. Cape Hatteras, North Carolina to New York City in six hours, 10 minutes, and eight seconds. Okay, what we're waiting for is to cross the latitudinal line of Hatteras Lighthouse, which is right there, and we're gonna do it right. We're gonna timestamp this photo right now. Whoa. Have you believed in anything? You risk your whole life to fulfill a dream. We just broke the world record from New York to Hatteras, huh? And just like that, the first leg was over. Somehow we had managed to break a very famous world record by Fountain of 6 hours, 10 minutes and 8 seconds from the Hatteras Lighthouse to the Statue of Liberty. An hour how to live official time, all backed up by GPS data going in the opposite direction, was 5 hours, 44 minutes and 9 seconds. With half of our run in the dark, we somehow beat a triple engine center console fountain offshore by over 25 minutes. I couldn't have been more proud for me and my wife, but there was really no time for celebration. This was just a small check mark in a massive daily mission. But it's over, and now it's time to fuel up for the next mission to Tybee Island, Georgia, 408 miles away. We were slightly ahead of schedule, but in order to stay there, it meant we were going to have to make this fueling quick and easy and without distraction. Here we are, Odin's dock, Hatteras owner, Dan Odin. If you guys try to get a picture of that on this door, and we'll send you guys swag. The the light, the, the buoy, the lighthouse, Jesus Christ, I'm fucked. I gotta do another 16 hours of this. 346 minutes later. All right, you guys, here we are at Odin's dock in Hatteras. Sarah and I just broke the, the world record. Three days later. And you guys know how this works on the channel. If you see a How to Live sticker, which happens to be on the front of the door, take a selfie with it, post it, tag us, and we'll send you swag. Take a selfie with Dan, too. Yeah, wicked nice guy. These guys are all awesome down here. So we're gonna go, we have to run. Thank you, Dan. I expect you I wish you luck. And uh, we've gotta go to Miami right now. We've got 800 miles. Oh. Okay. Honey, watch. All right, here we go. Off for the second leg. Fourth leg, not third leg, really, but this is the second leg for the breakfast in New York, dinner in Miami. One of the most challenging things with Hatteras is accessing it from the open ocean, both north and south. Many people wash their boats up on the shifting sands here. We were not going to be one of them. So steady as she goes and look for the breakers. And it helps this boat only drafts about a foot on plane. Just left Hatteras and we're not chartered territory here. And we're not quite sure what see that's in that sandbar. Which side that's supposed to be on? I would I'm gonna keep that yeah, on my right side. On your starboard. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna both do this right here. Being married to a police officer definitely has its perks, when she carries hearing protection from the shooting range wherever she goes. Now these outboards aren't very loud, but after hours and hours of operation, the whining can start to play tricks on your mind. Hearing protection engaged and sanity restored. Well, it doesn't look it, but um, it's bumpy out here. And uh, we're only able to do 60, 65. Here we go. Spent a full hundred miles. Uh, Cycling, 
doing this, spent about 300 of it in the air. The 400 mile leg from Hatteras to Tybee Island, Georgia was long, arduous, and bumpy. And to tell you the truth, there just wasn't much to show you guys. Well, besides Sarah puking in her coffee cup every five minutes, which out of respect for her, I'm not gonna show you. She got really sick and dehydrated. In fact, there was a time I thought it was gonna be over. We were gonna have to call it quits. But every minute that passed was a minute closer. And she knew that. As a husband, I couldn't have been more proud of her. Two is the threes. Wildly, but it sucked. We are 34 miles from Tappy Island. We had a 15 minute break from fuel. And we're back out to the Miami. This is uh, the hardest thing I've ever done. And you simply haven't lived until you're refueling a boat offshore on the edge of a thunderstorm after 800 miles of boating. Now, we didn't know it at the time because we were about eight miles away from Tybee Island, but it was this thunderhead that was gonna spell doom for the entire adventure from New York City to Miami. Or was it? Then this rolls in behind us. The problem was we had to go out the exact same way we came in, which is about eight miles up into that storm. What would you do with an open canopy boat with open fuel on deck? Would you try to punch through it, or would you wait it out? At that point, we were about an hour and a half ahead of schedule. Wow. And just like that, uh, our record attempt is in major jeopardy. We are fueling up, Thunderhead came in, and uh, put things on pause. Nothing we can do. It does get worse. We have like to do this in record speed, but we finally are able to get out from under this thunderhead and uh, get this boat out of here with this much fuel on board. Um, wouldn't have been smart to uh, drive this under under what was that massive tornado, hurricane slash um, typhoon-ish Savannah, Georgia shit show. I just don't think that the timing could have been any worse. For that we're at our last stop before miami we're about an hour ahead of schedule to beat the record right as we're feeling up a huge thunderhead comes in Thund thundering lightning everywhere and so we had to wait now we still have to go through it because it's on that side yeah well let's go when you're ready look at this yeah, yeah we're soaked it's on fun we were both beaten physically mentally but we had to push on we knew there was still a possibility to make the record but as we left Tabby Island, we had to keep going eastward to avoid the big thunderheads offshore, pushing us further and further out to sea and further away from Florida. There was no instruction manual for what we were doing. We just had to have faith in each other and the equipment we were in and just push forward. pushing the envelope at 100 miles an hour, we were able to skirt around the storms and finally push westward. And this is when we finally found Florida. We felt like settlers hundreds of years ago, discovering land for the first time. Sarah says, honey, I think that's Jacksonville. A moment I'll never forget. From Maine to Florida in three days, and from New York City to Jacksonville, Florida in less than a day. All by boat, husband and wife. Hi everybody, we're here. We're in Florida, we made it. We wanted to give you guys the good news. Uh, it was, I don't even know. I don't even know. One of the craziest trips, uh, the craziest things I've ever done. We've been in the boat now for 16 hours. Um, we decided not to go to Miami tonight because it's got major thunderstorms and we get caught up in a couple today. And to tackle a thunderstorm in the middle of the night is another whole 
uh, danger sandwich that we don't want to eat because we've been doing danger sandwiches all day. Um, so yeah, we pulled into St. Augustine, so we made it to Florida. Okay, hon, do you want to do the honors in this, in this St. Augustine hotel? Go ahead. Let's see what, it, let's see. Let's see how it compares. <laughs> Honey, that was the wimpiest, that was the wimpiest thing I've ever seen. I'm so sunburned. You should see your face. <laughs> it's not bad. You should see What's wrong with my face? You should see your face without that. Hold on. Unwrinkle your forehead. <laughs> Why it's so funny, everybody? <laughs> there is a record from New York City to Miami for outboards. And it's not 19 hours, it's 40 hours and two minutes. There's a reason why it's an outboard record that's longer than an inboard boat. And we found out yesterday why. We need radar and we need protection from huge thunder boomers. Yeah. And the Gentry had that. Yeah. Gentry was like a house on, house on motors. That was a big differentiating factor for us. We couldn't roll into Miami um, at night in, that, in those conditions without radar. At, at you know, at, we would need to average. We we had a great time yesterday rolling the Tybee. We were going to beat the record by two hours. You have to roll at 70 miles, 80 miles an hour, in in at night into um, a 60 mile wide thunder boomer would have been suicide. It's not safe for us or people around us. That's the reason why there's a 19 hour record for big boats that you have shelter and you have radar, and there's a 40 hour record for outboards. So Sarah and I get up this morning, revigorated a little bit. I. Uh, Pretty sure I've rubbed out, but, um, or a light bit of it, but. Uh, you CrossFit, you know what rubbed out is. We're gonna get back in this boat. We're gonna get down to Miami. If we get down there by, I believe it's 8, 10 tonight, we will break, we will have a, a world record for New York to Miami. We will not give up. It's like Terminator. You remember when, when he got, when he, he had his arms, no, his legs ripped off and he was just crawling across the ground and they had to kill him with the press? That is who we feel like today. When I'm on the water and I'm, and I'm needing to dig deep, I'm thinking that that's what I'm kind of thinking about. And just like that, we were back in the game. Not for the record that we wanted, but for the record that was probably most appropriate for what we were in. All we had to do was drive 300 miles down the mid-Florida coastline and get to Miami before eight o'clock at night. The seas had laid down from the night before and we were both feeling that this just might be the best leg of the entire adventure. What? If you've never boated by Cape Canaveral, well, it's pretty cool. You might just say it's far out. Yep, pun intended. And a protein bar with some beef jerky. Perfect. Fuel tank swap, honey, you got this? Crossing into North Miami. I'm gonna bring it off plane. I'm gonna bring it off plane. Cause you know what? Government cut. That's a finish line for everybody else. This is a finish line for me and you. You can tell it. This is a finish line for me and you. You and I just drove our boat in about a day from New York City to Miami. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being such a trooper. Thanks for bringing me on your adventures. And I saw you, I saw many times, I looked in your face yesterday and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing to my wife? I didn't expect it to be that hard and that much pain. You live this life once. Ooh. 
What memories will you capture? But most importantly, who will you capture them with? Government cut, Miami, Florida. We did it. As the onslaught of adrenaline finally drained from my veins, after these two days of perseverance and struggle, I was left empty and drained and stunned. The only thing I could feel at that moment was love. This is the people I'm talking about. The best YouTube channel ever lives says it all. This will be our year. Look how far we have come. We cannot stop there. And leave our work on time. Gonna move these mountains one by one. With new frontiers. Our spirit never swayed We faced our fears Watch the shadows fade Our vision's clear Focus is locked on tight By the end of the weekend, Sarah and I, with our small team, were able to establish two brand new world records and break two existing ones. With over 60,000 time-stamped waypoints, How to Live certifies these records itself. This was not a Guinness World Book of Records sanctioned event. These are now, officially to us anyways, How to Live records. And we enthusiastically welcome and encourage any challengers and look forward to the day they will be broken once again. You might just make it in a How to Live episode. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Please like, share, and comment if you like this content. And it might just give us some motivation to get back out there for the next series. Because that one's going to be a catch and cook adventure in the Bahamas with a 440 and a Super Kraken 52. Until next time, everybody, please boat safe, boat happy. This is Mike and Sarah from How to Live. Over and out. Guy. Guy, you gotta go. Oh, get so hey, good. You're not supposed to touch him. Guy, you gotta go. Listen. Get. You gotta go out the gate. Are you responsible for letting him in? Demi? I let all things Come on. live. <laughs> we gotta go. Come on, let's go. I don't wanna grab your ears. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get behind him, he's gonna come back. He's gonna come back. Listen, I'm big bad, I'm the big bad dude. Okay. See? I'm big bad. Timmy, be the big bad dude. Be the big bad dude. Come on, buddy. little thing. <laughs> I like your antlers. They're really soft. <laughs> okay.
All right, things are really chaotic right now. Mother Nature did a, a pulled a quick one this morning and took the weather window away for tomorrow. Tomorrow's is gonna be blowing like four footers. So it's been an all out assault on this checklist to get things done and in the water. It's two o'clock now, hon. Are we good? Yes. Logistics queen. Yes, we're good. All right, let's go. Ready to roll. Can you do that? Three days later. Well, honey, just like that, it's over. It went by so fast. Are you sad? I am sad. It. We've been planning this for so long, and then all of a sudden, we're done. It's over. Our adventure's over. But here's the good news. On to other adventures. Gonna move these mountains.